Well, hello everyone and, and welcome. Um, my name is Jennifer Corey on, and on behalf of uh, the board, uh, Board Ready Women, Heather Culbert, Sippy Chena, Kathy Samuel, we're so happy to have you with us today. Uh, we've had um, over 180 registered for this uh, exciting session. So we're, we're really, really thrilled that you can join us. I wanna spend a, a quick few minutes on just reviewing what uh, Board Ready Women have done this year. We've had quite an exciting year in spite of the pandemic. On uh, February 9th, we had a session on proxy advisors, their roles and their impact and the best practices and how to engage with proxy advisors. On April 26, we had a discussion on strategy and imperative um, in, in ways to think about strategy during uncertain times. And on October 13th, we had a fantastic panel um, about discussing what it takes to be an effective and valued board member. Um, the other thing we've done is we've actually populated our tools section with um, what we have uh, heard a, a variety of super good tools for women that are trying to get on their first board, some interview guides, some formats for board CVs, et cetera. Um, our membership today is at just over about 125 members with two corporate sponsors. And those members are from all over Canada, Alberta, BC, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nunavut, the USA. It's pretty exciting. Uh, another exciting thing that's happened with us over the last six months is we've had over 28 companies come to us uh, for search requests for their boards for over 44 positions. So I really implore the members out there in the audience to get your profiles up to date. Go in, put your latest board, your latest experiences on there because we use that data as our search engine when these uh, organizations come to us. Another exciting thing I'd like to announce is that we've established a partnership with Women in Mining Canada that have 14 chapters across Canada and many, many women that are interested in sitting on boards. So we'll be offering that membership to, to that group of women. There's over 2000 um, members in WIN Canada across Canada. So that's pretty exciting. And for those of you that are not members, I would, I would really encourage you to sign up for us. We, um, it, it really feels like we're gaining momentum here in a lot of different ways. And uh, we're so committed to getting women on boards that we sure could use your support and mentorship and, and, and your data in our database so we can help you. And also a shout out to any corporate sponsors out there that you know, would like to, to help uh, with, with this endeavor. It, Included in that uh, membership would be, you know, up to five members that can use our tools, come to our events, uh, be part of that, and they can be five members at different times. So I'd really ask you to think about joining if you're not already a part of our membership, but we'd sure love to have you. Finally, I thought I'd share some uh, interesting statistics that we came across. Um, the Canadian Securities Administrator's seventh year review included disclosures of 115 uh, TSX listed Alberta companies um, and some very interesting stats that show we're making some progress. Women hold in Alberta of these companies 21% of board positions, an increase from 18% in 2020 and a whopping 8% in 2015. So we are making progress, still not enough, but progress. 80% of companies have one or more women on their boards compared to 74% in 2020 and only 46% in Alberta in 2015. Again, another, another stat that uh, we're showing progress on. Last year, um, and, and so far in 2021, by the way, 34% uh, of board vacancies were filled by women an increase from 25% in 2017. Alberta's largest companies continue to have the highest percentage of gender diversity among board members. Of the Alberta-based companies that form part of the TSX 60 index, 34% of board positions are held by women. 
and 100% have two or more women on their boards, and 89% report one or more women in their executive ranks. So, you know, that gives me and, and our team here at Board Ready Women some very um, hopeful stats on, on the direction and the trajectory this is taking. So um, good news, some good news. We can do better and we're gonna do better. Now I'd like to turn to our very exciting event today. I'd like to introduce you to Martha Piper and Indira Samarasikara. Oh, I think I said it right, so Indira. <laughs> um, who are the authors of NER Lessons in Leadership from Two Women Who Went First. Really briefly, Martha Piper served as the first woman president of the University of Alberta and has been a director of the Bank of Montreal, Shoppers Drug Mart, and TransAlta Corporation. An officer of the Order of Canada, she was born in Lorraine, Ohio, and lives with her husband, William Piper, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome, Martha. And Indira served as the first woman president of the University of Alberta, is a director of Magna International, TC Energy, and Stelco. She's also served as a director of the Bank of Nova Scotia. She is also an officer of the Order of Canada. She was born in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. With that, I'd like to turn it over to one of my friends and board members of Board Ready Women, Heather Calvert. Thank you, Jen, and uh, welcome everyone today. And I just wanted to make one small, um, I think, correction there. Martha, you were the first uh, female um, president of the University of Toronto. Is that correct? No. The University of British Columbia. UBC. She said University of Alberta. I'm going, I thought it was U, U of T anyway. I didn't have it in front of me. Anyway, University of British Columbia. Sorry about that. Anyway, welcome everyone. And, and thanks to everyone for joining us today to discuss this fantastic book, Nerve. And that's probably backwards on your screen. But this is the book that has been written by, uh, co-authored by Martha and Indira. And uh, so thanks so much, Martha and Indira, for joining us. We're so appreciative of you taking the time uh, to share with us as we all transition from our senior leadership roles to uh, that of being on boards. I have read your book and I'm very excited for you to share your perspectives and leadership lessons. And I very much look forward to moderating this panel. But before I start, I just wanted to uh, see if there's a few things you wanted to say just to kind of open up the discussion. So Indira, do, do you have a few opening comments you'd like to share? Well, Heather and, and Jen, first of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting us uh, to participate. Uh, it's good to be back in Alberta, so to speak, virtually uh, joining you. Um, my comments are, you know, when I think about board ready women, I'm, I'm just, I can't help but think, I wish you were there when I became a board member. I mean, the organization that you are building and as Jen said, has momentum is going to be invaluable as we are on a journey and we haven't got to the destination. So uh, I'm very pleased that to be part of it. I'd also like to say it's been an absolute thrill to write this book with Martha. Um, Martha and I worked together at UBC for many years before I left for Alberta, but it's interesting when you write a book, how well you get to know another person and, you know, uh, the nerve, the courage, the inspiration and the lessons I've learned from her are just amazing. So it's delighting to be here today uh, to have this discussion uh, with all of you and with her. Very good. Thank you, Martha. Well, I echo Indira in terms of thanking Board Ready Women uh, for inviting us and also congratulate you. I was so taken by Jen's kind of summary of what the progress you've made. It's quite remarkable and well done. I mean, I wish as Indira said, we had had this kind of resource 10 years ago. Um, let me just say a little bit, if, if I may, Heather, about the title of the book because people often ask us, what did we mean by nerve? And how does that associate with boards? And, and that of course is what we're focusing on today. Some of you may know I'm absolutely crazy about Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, she lived, you know, in the 
early 20th century and painted at a time where women weren't painting. And all the artists of the day were going to Europe to study with the Impressionists. And she said, no, 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 no. I'm going to paint what I want to paint. I'm not going to paint what other people paint. And she went out, as you know, to New Mexico and painted skulls and flowers and landscapes. And if you look at her paintings, you will see they're pretty nervy in many ways. And she has a saying that's over my desk that was given to me by a friend in Alberta when I left. And the saying is this, it takes more than talent. It takes a kind of nerve, a kind of nerve and a lot of hard, hard work. And we love that quote. And we often use it with women because we, it's very reassuring. You don't have to be particularly talented and we know how to work hard, but often what we lack is nerve, nerve to do things a little differently, nerve to speak out, nerve to take a stand that might be against the flow, nerve to act decisively, nerve to be unliked if you like. And as Indira and I looked at it in the book, uh, I think it really reflects the role that women have now on boards. They have to step up, sometimes do things a little differently than their male counterparts, have the nerve to confront power, have the nerve to influence, nerve to speak out. So that's kind of the capturing of the title, but I think it runs through the book and we hope that it resonates with women today. Well, I can tell you it certainly does with me. Thank you very much for, for those comments, with ladies. Um, you mentioned in your book about transitioning from being a CEO and president to being a board member, and that it was challenging in some respects. So specifically, that you were no longer in command of the organization's agenda or priorities for discussion. And since I know there are so many type A personalities with us today, I thought it would be very apropos to, to have, that, uh, have that question and delve into that a little bit. So can you give us a few tips about your experiencing transitioning to being a member of a board? So do you want, Martha, do you want to start? Yeah, and then, um, yeah. you know, um, thanks again, Heather, for that question. I think it's very relevant. It was, let me just put it bluntly, it was very difficult. It was extraordinarily difficult for me, and I think Indira would echo that. Uh, the role is different uh, in that you're no longer in charge, you don't have control, you play a very different role as a member of a team and your voice, you have to find your voice, you have to figure out where you fit and where you can add value. So here's my simple advice to women who are going onto boards after leading and having a different role. First, recognize that it's normal to feel uncomfortable and to feel that you're kind of a duck out of water. And two, it takes time. Don't be impatient. It takes time to find your voice and to figure out where you sit. But how do you do that? One of the things Indira talks about in the book is that she really watched other board members, how they function, the ones that are really seem to be doing it well and try to emulate some of their behaviors. I typically, my default was take a course. And so, you know, I read everything I could. I went to Harvard, I went to Wharton. I took courses on uh, how to be the best director in, in a corporate kind of setting. And I also identified women mentors not necessarily on the board, the board I was serving, but women who had served on other boards or were serving on boards who I could confide in. And this is where Board Ready, I think, is just so wonderful. You've got a network of women you can draw on and you must do that. And then finally, don't underestimate the role of the chair of the board. You know, I think the chair of the board can be incredibly constructive and instructive. And if you can find the nerve, to you know, go and speak with the chair and seek their advice because they want you to succeed and they can best tell you where they see you fitting in. So those are some of my suggestions. Wonderful, Martha, thank you. Indira, any thoughts? Well, no, not a lot to add. I think the notion of listening to others is one that I really found extremely useful. Uh, I remember being on the board of Bank of Nova Scotia, and as you can imagine, what I knew about banking, you could stuff in a thimble. 
<laughs> and so I was just absolutely lost. And I remember listening to Ron Brenneman, who many uh, from Alberta would know well, CEO of Petrocan. He almost always asked a question and you could hear and feel in the room that he had struck a chord. And I think it's picking up on the questions of the right of the directors who seem to advance the conversation, I think is really the way in which you can learn how to be a good a corporate board member. Very good. Thank you, ladies. Um, on to the next. So how beneficial is the network um, that you established while you're in your CEO roles? And perhaps an example as to how that has benefited your board career. And Dara, do you want to start that one, please? Yeah. So let me make a point about, first of all, this links very much to mentors and sponsors. And I really want to talk about going before I became president, because, you know, it's that first board position that I'm sure many of your listeners are interested in. You know, how did you get that first board position? And this is where the notion of mentors versus sponsors is important. Mentors are people you get advice from. But the word sponsor are those people that you may or may not know who actively advance your career and frequently advocate for you to go on a board member. And so this is the story I want to tell about a sponsor. I was a professor of materials engineering. I had something called the chair of uh, Dofasco China Advanced Steel Processing. Uh, and I would every year decide, I decided to send a Christmas card to the CEO. I didn't know the man at all. I'd never met him, John Mabry. I just sent this Christmas card. Dear John. Thank you for supporting the chair, blah, blah, blah. Time went on. I then uh, become president of University of Alberta and I decided to, to give my Christmas card to you of a, they invite him for the installa in installation. He shows up. I'm stunned. What are you doing here? John introduces himself. And he said, I'm now retired and I was delighted that you'd invited me. Fast forward three years later, my phone rings and it's John Mabry again. Uh, and I'm now president of University of Alberta. And he says, I want to have coffee with you because I want to nominate you for a position of the board of the Bank of Nova Scotia because I am coming, incoming chair of the board. Now, there is an example of a sponsor, someone I didn't know, someone who took note of the work that I did. Perhaps my sending him a Christmas card reminded him that I existed. But most importantly, when I asked him, so why do you think I can serve on a bank board? I don't know anything about banking. He said, because you run a complex institution, uh, the bank wants to expand its footprint in Alberta. Uh, U of A is an important institution in Alberta and you're a woman. And I think it's time we had women on the board. So I, I tell the story because it's those individuals who observe you and sponsor you that get you your first board position. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. That's how it happened for me as well. Um, Martha. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think these things work in mysterious ways. Networks work in mysterious ways. And they don't often, they don't always have immediate impact. But over time, they are extremely important. And my example, my Alberta example, if you like, is how did I get on the board of TransAlta, all right? And I know nothing about electricity generation, right? But I put it down to two things. One was an event that I went to at the conference board of Canada. This is years before I get invited to be on that board. But I sit on a panel with Steve Snyder, who is the CEO of TransAlta, and we interact. And he remembers me, okay? He remembers me. And this is probably five years before he comes to me and invites me to be on the board. Along with another person on that board, sometimes the networks have to be interchanged, Gordon Giffen. Gordon Giffen, at the time I worked with him, was ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Canada during the Clinton years. He was on the board of TransAlta. He worked with me at UBC to create the U.S. studies program. We worked together. I never hear from Gordon for two or three years. 
pick up the phone? Would you like to think about being on the Trans Delta board? I am convinced that had I not been at that conference board meeting and on the panel, and had I not had an interaction with Gordon Giffen to establish a US studies program, that network, I would never have gotten on or wouldn't have gotten on in the same way, the Trans Alta board. So these networks, and it is sponsors, it is people who recognize you, not when you're trying to get on a board, <laughs> but before you're trying to get on a board. Mm -hmm. It's how you perform in doing what you're doing and people will recognize it and they put it in a little part of their brain and then, and it comes up in mysterious times. So my message is do what you're doing extremely well and create these networks so people recognize when you're doing something extremely well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And, and it's also about being seen, right? So participating on panels, um, you know, when you're asked to speak at something, uh, you know, coming and, and, and speaking on, on something that you're passionate about or, or that you have expertise in, it's important to be seen. It, it is. Let me just say, though, it's important to be seen, but you have to use that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You can't just go to a reception and mingle. You have to go and be seen and be doing what you do well, contributing adding value to the discussion, making a point. Actually, you know, it's networking is not just going out to dinner and sitting next to somebody. It's actually adding value and distinguishing yourself when you're at that dinner. Right, exactly. Very well said. So you indicate there's never been a better time to be a woman leader seeking a corporate board position. And in your book, you refer to our time has come, which I totally agree with. Uh, what is your advice to women who are seeking a board position when they are qualified, but yet the phone is not ringing? And I think this is a frustration I can tell you that I certainly had um, for many years when I you know, uh, retired as a, as a senior executive. So why isn't the phone ringing? Martha, why don't you start with that one? Well, I'd like to turn to Indira on this because she okay. has a wonderful story and I think it's incredibly okay. instructive. So um, I, was, I was on the board of Scotia Bank already, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm not a typical corporate director. That was entirely fortuitous from the story I told you. I was retiring from uh, U of A and I was wondering whether my phone would ring at all and would I get a, a join another corporate board. So I approached the chair of the board of Bank of Nova Scotia, Tom O'Neill, and asked his advice. And he said, you know, Indira, when I stepped out from PricewaterhouseCoopers, I worried about the same thing. I worried that I would not get the boards that I wanted to be on. So here's what I did. He said, first of all, I let many colleagues know I was available. Secondly, he, uh, he said, I studied the proxy circulars of 20 some companies narrowed it down to 10 where I really felt I could add value. I knew either one of the directors on the board or I knew the CEO and I wrote 10 letters, okay? And he got on board. So he said, you need to do the same thing. So I said, okay. So I studied proxy circulars and I said, well, where would I fit? Well, I'm a mechanical engineer, cars, nothing better than cars for a mechanical engineer. And so I zeroed in on Magna and I discovered that there were two people on the board I knew, but one in particular, Peter Harder, who had been a deputy minister and I had you know, encountered him in government. So it took me two weeks to find the nerve to send him an email. But I did finally, after about two weeks of humming and hawing, I sent an email and said, you know, I know you may be looking for a director if you are not now, even down the road. 24 hours later, I get a message back saying, your timing is perfect. Let me introduce you to the chair of the board and the CEO. So it was about reaching out, taking the advice of men who seem to do this effortlessly. And women need to learn to ask, but it's also important to figure out which board you want to join and why, and what value are you going to add? And how do you appeal to the person on the board with who you have a good relationship, who knows what you can bring to the board to be your advocate. 
So that was my example. And uh, I think very few women actually find the courage or the nerve to do that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Martha. And, yeah. And so Heather, my first comment would be join board ready women. <laughs> That's the first thing. I mean, what you're doing is fabulous for women. And, and as we both have said, uh, you know, we wish we had had that. But here's what I, women come to us all the time and ask us, my phone isn't ringing, how can I make this happen? And here's kind of, I mean, until I had heard Indira's story, I mean, my goodness, that's an amazing story. But here's what I often tell women. First, be selective, which is what Indira was saying. Do your homework, you know, um, a very, wise woman once told me it's easier to get on than to get off so you know pick pick the boards that you really think interest you that you have a uh, 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 I don't know whether it's an expertise but a passion for and understanding of the industry second almost every board now certainly uh, the the large market cap but even the smaller boards are no longer just coming up with who does Joe know, they are actually engaging consultants to help them find good new directors. And I would suggest that um, women make themselves known to these consultants. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, are still in Toronto and need to think about being in the West and having an office in the West. But if if the office is in Toronto, I still suggest that the women actually go physically, make themselves known, make themselves uh, tell, the, tell the consultants what their strengths are, leave CVs, and make it clear that they're willing to wait until there's an appropriate opening. But these so consultants now are seriously looking for qualified women, and they need as much help in identifying them as women need help in identifying the corporation. So it's a matchmaking. And I think we need to be as assertive and as instructive as we can be in making sure that those who are consulting with the corporations are aware of the qualified women that are there. So those would be my, one of my suggestions, but what you, and your colleagues are doing in Board Ready Women is exactly what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. We, we truly believe in it as well. And I, you know, and I think that that just kind of leads to the next question is that we are making progress. I mean, we're, we're hearing the statistics and, and they are you know, moving in the right trajectory as, as Jen said, um, but we still know that there's still underrepresentation on boards um, for women and diverse populations even though evidence points to the benefits of better representations on the, uh, of the populations that we serve. So what is the best approach for, to advocate for women and discuss this with boards and how do you rectify the situation? Who would like to go first on that one? Martha. Maybe, maybe Martha. I'll take, I'll take okay. that. And, right. and Heather, if I may, I'd like to read something from the book. Certainly. Um, it's a section around uh, just this question. How do we as women help boards uh, find other women or move that agenda? So let me just share with the attendees a section of the book. It said, when I assumed the chair of the governance and nominating committee of BMO, corporate boards were being challenged to adopt diversity targets and policy. The chair of the board, Rob Pritchard, tasked me with addressing this issue and bringing forward recommendations on how we might as a board confront gender diversity. Naively, I assumed that responding to this request would not be difficult and that the adoption of a progressive diversity policy would be straightforward. With Rob's wholehearted support, I recommended that the board act aggressively and set an ambitious goal of having a board composition in which each gender comprised at least one third of the independent directors. I advocated that the bank confirm its intent by approving a diversity policy that would be publicly available on our board website. In short, I was recommending the bank set a gender diversity quota, which as you know, has been very controversial. 
While I obtained committee approval, I encountered some resistance when debating the policy at the board. The age old arguments were put forward. This policy would hurt qualified women who would view their appointment as being solely based on being female. The policy would be difficult to implement as there were still not enough qualified women to serve because there were so few women CEOs of major corporations and because many directors thought you needed a CEO experience to qualify. Women were therefore ineligible for consideration. I, as chair of this committee, countered as best as I could. I gave statistics on women who had advanced degrees, on the numbers of women who had reached the highest levels of achievement and who had distinguished themselves in various fields. I argue the importance of having a diverse set of directors who were more representative of our employers, customers, and shareholders. I continued with new evidence that demonstrated women were the financial managers in their households and were acquiring wealth at a high rate. The world was changing and women were a major factor in that change. The bank needed to embrace this change. Fortunately, the chair of the board, Rob Pritchard, and the CEO, Bill Down, both strongly supported the policy. And after some rather rigorous debate, surprisingly for me, it passed. Once the policy was established, it had immediate effect. We had been mucking around on this for years. It required a policy. It required a quota. Immediately, when we were recruiting new directors, the policy was always front and center, driving who was being nominated and considered. We charged the search consultants with bringing us the names of women who had all the qualifications we required. In short, it worked. So my point is, as women, and as women who are on boards, we have the responsibility and the determination to ensure that these boards have a diverse group of directors. And we need to step up and work and counter all the arguments. And I'll go as far as saying, and I never was a fan of quotas, but right now I think quotas play a role. And I think it may be just a medium role. At some point, we may not need quotas. But until we actually keep our feet to the fire, there will be excuse after excuse made as to why, you know, Joe should be appointed instead of Jill. So, you know, I, I think that as women who are on the boards, we need to step up and assume that responsibility. Right. Thank you very much. So, and, and so you would not argue the point that there aren't enough qualified women then, because Absolutely that's, that's, not. One of the, that's one of the uh, responses that I get from time to time. Well, there just aren't well, enough qualified women. And also that the only reason that they'd be appointed was because they were a woman and therefore they would do women more harm. And right. all of those arguments are ridiculous. They're red herrings. Mm -hmm. And we need to just counter it with the evidence that shows very dramatically there are more qualified women actually if you look at women graduating from all the professional programs and undergraduate program there are more women qualified than men in many of those fields mm -hmm. so you know absolutely very good but we need to have the nerve to speak up mm -hmm. and counter some mm -hmm. of that yep exactly so maybe we'll teach a course just on how to get the nerve right because sometimes, <laughs> that's right. sometimes I think you know like that's 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 the biggest step right is just kind of steal yourself and and do it and you know what most of us who have made it to this point in our careers believe me you have demonstrated nerve it, yeah. it's just a matter of of finding it and and executing it on different levels Indira please do you do you have anything to add on the Yes, I mean, I think, yeah. let, me, let me address the question of qualifications, because mm -hmm. I faced exactly that on the board of Magna. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, being in the automotive industry, there's not that many women who work in that sector. And, and, and we, we had the same thing. This is where headhunters become really useful. Gone are the days where it's the old boys network. And in, in the case, I wasn't quite yet chair of the governance committee, but I was on the committee and I was asked to be involved with the interview process. And we identified an Asian female who had never been a CEO. Uh, and she wasn't, she hadn't had a very senior role, but she had a very influential role in the, what I call the 
infotainment business, the connected cars of the future. And we were looking for someone to bring that background, not necessarily the automotive, you know, nuts and bolts, if you will. And we, we, we appointed her again, there was some resistance because, you know, she was non-traditional, but again, we appointed her and she has been fantastic because she's brought, she's not only a diverse candidate, but she's brought a diversity of exp expertise more than qualified. And we had many to choose from. So I think this business of not enough qualified women is absolutely a red herring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would totally agree with that. And so the critical success factors, is there anything that we've missed there in that discussion? So critical success factors that will result in success um, of appointments. So you had, you had talked about quotas, you had talked about bringing you know, evidence, you had talked about um, you know, various uh, qualifications other than being a CEO. What, what are there other ones that we have missed here? Let me just say, I think it's really important that we provide support once women are appointed. Okay. For that first year or two, to because it's it's tough. It's tough, you know, when you're either one or two or three women on the board of a board of twelve, and there's so much scrutiny, and you're 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 trying to make a difference. And I found I, I think we need to, and I would urge board ready women to think about providing that kind of support once your members get appointed to to help them a place where they can come and and seek some guidance or advice because um you know we want everyone to succeed and it's really important uh, that they feel um supported as they move into these new roles mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. I, I think a lot of the time, you know, we, we all think we know what we're going to, you know, we can anticipate what it's going to look like when you're on a board, but sometimes you just, you need to talk to somebody about it that's outside and that will keep that confidence that will actually give you the straight goods, right? It's great if you have someone like that on your board that, will, that you can actually confide in, but if that doesn't happen, then I, I agree. I think that that's something board ready women will definitely look at, at providing as far as an advisory kind of aspect um, for women that are, that are, you know, just want, want to be able to talk about it. So yeah, no, that's a great idea. Anything else to add, Andira, before we move no. on to the next one? Great. Okay, great. Thank you. In your book, you speak to the four myths that undermine women's effectiveness as board members. Um, and, and I found this fascinating because it's exactly, I agreed with every single one of them. So please go ahead, tell us your advice. Martha. Well, these are four, there may be others and maybe not all of these apply to everyone. But the first myth that we identified is, there is no such thing as a dumb question. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was told, don't worry, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question. That is a myth. There are dumb questions. <laughs> There are many dumb questions and you need, you need to figure out how not to ask dumb questions. And I put in here, me too, copycat questions fall into the category of worthless interruptions. Micro detailed questions are a close second. The burden of becoming an effective board member lies in trying to look at the big trends, the macro picture, connecting the dots between data and strategy, and asking questions that can move the company forward rather than just take up airtime. Mm -hmm. So, and again, Indira talks about listening to other really outstanding board directors and how they ask questions because you don't want to get into a situation where everyone rolls their eyes when you ask a question. Second myth, silence is golden. Now, you don't want to be interrupting and being the board member who's always talk, 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 but you're being paid to speak and to add value. And no one wants a board director who never says a word. And again, I don't mean just seconding emotion or saying, yes, I agree with what John just said. You need to figure out when to intervene and how to intervene 
and to use your voice properly. Uh, so silence is not golden. Three, myth three. This one is more controversial, but I firmly believe it. And the myth is limit your interventions to those areas in which you are an expert. Often people will say, well, I was put on a board because I'm a human resource person or I'm a finance person. And therefore, those, that's where I'm expected to, to speak. And I think women tend to, be, uh, tend to do this more. They end up being pigeonholed as only being able to speak about marketing or only being able to speak about communications or government affairs or whatever. Again, you're not being paid to just be an expert. You're being paid to be able to look at the big picture, bring wisdom, learn how to intervene and to push the corporation forward on the major issues. So, you know, our experience suggests that women directors tend to become easily pigeonholed. And we need to think about how we can assist women to have a broader perspective. Think about many of the male directors who come in and who, what, you know, who, who don't limit themselves to their one area of expertise. They're all over the map. And, and so I'm not sure that we want to always emulate that, but we need to be sure that we don't get um, just narrowly uh, almost defined by our own expertise. And the fourth myth, myth is you can go it alone. And we've already talked about that. You really need to be part of a team. You're one of many around the board. You cannot uh, ta tackle the, the corporation by yourself, but you also need to look for where you can find assistance and support. And I was so fortunate because I identified a woman director who had had a lot of experience and I really used her to help me in those early stages. So those were the four myths we identified and I'm sure there are many more and Indira may want to speak to some of them as well. No, Martha, those, I mean, I wouldn't disagree. Let me give you an example of the kind of question that one should ask. And I, this was a piece of advice I got when I was first joining the board of Bank of Nova Scotia. I was terrified. And I remember saying to an alumni, uh, alumnus, Bruce Regal, who was actually a senior vice president at Deutsche Bank, that I was terrified. And he said, would you like to talk to the chair of the board of Deutsche Bank and ask him why, uh, what kinds of questions, what kind of a directors that banks are looking for? It was the best conversation I'd ever had because he said to me, look, we don't need any more bankers. We've got plenty of them. And look what happened to the banking system. This was after 2008, right? Where were the experts asking the question, why these so-called uh, investment grade asset-backed mortgages were giving such high yields if they were so, so, that if they were so safe, right? Mm -hmm. Where was the board member that didn't ask, are you sure these investments are risk-free and so on? So, what you learn from that is the kind of the quality of the question you need to ask is to challenge the fundamental assumptions that experts often miss or don't are blindsided to. So mm -hmm. I think the business of the quality of the questions, as I said, uh, is absolutely uh, important to making a contribution on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, Kather, could I could I just add one thing to that? Absolutely. We, we've identified what we think is the right thing to do. And it sounds easy, but it's not. And I still second guess almost every intervention I ever make at a board. <laughs> um, and I think, and again, this is a generalization, but I think women often, and it's the nerve, they fear that what they're going to say especially when they get out of their lane a little bit, will not be valued or is inappropriate or is irrelevant or whatever. And so we hesitate. Should we intervene? How do we intervene? And when we garner up the nerve to say exactly, to ask the kind of question that Indira just identified, you know, is this really, I mean, here are the men, oh, this is a great thing. We need to do this. We're going to go, you know, and you're thinking in your back of your head, Gee, I'm not so sure. I don't, I don't know this is risk-free. 
should I say anything? Mm -hmm. And when you finally conjure up the nerve to say it, you know, kind of there's a bit of silence and people may or may not listen. But then what happens? You go home and you worry. Why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> oh my goodness, what are people going to think of me? Why did I why did I ever think I should could have said anything like that? This is what we're talking about with nerve. Part of that is just ingrained in us to second guess ourselves, but somehow we need to have more confidence in our own abilities and our own way of doing things and find the nerve to actually say what we think needs to be said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's, there's a much, much truth in that for sure. And I just wanted to, uh, again, say that, you know, this is this is not about male versus female, I just, you know, and I know that that wasn't your intention, Martha, the intention is, is that who is going to actually, you know, whether they be male or female, who can you actually get to, to be supportive of you on a board? How do you, how do you uh, work with, with uh, male or female? So it, it really doesn't, uh, it's not one way or the other, but women do have a hard time finding the nerve. I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Uh, my one myth that, that uh, op it, it's not even a myth. It's just people need to know the difference between an operational question and a governance related yes. question. And it drives me crazy. You know, yes. you had talked about micro detailing, but yep. it drives me crazy because it does just really show that they don't understand their role as a board member, right? So, Absolutely. so it's, it's really, really important. Um, that's one of the things that I've noticed. All right, broadening connections. And I think we've already kind of, you guys have already given us some great plugs here, but again, broadening connections uh, to women leaders, consulting with retired leaders and engaging in your network. Why is it important and how relevant are organizations like Board Ready Women at this time of our evolution? Now, I know that that's probably a very leading question, but I, you know, I also believe that, you know, like network, network, network is probably a, a message that people need to get strong and clear. So is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yes, I think it's about, and I think Board Ready Women, uh, you know, it, the opportunity to contribute in a place like Board Ready Women, right? Not just go for networking, but help build the organization, Heather. Mm -hmm. Help mm -hmm. contribute, help think about how Board Ready Women can be uh, more impactful. I think that's really how uh, your, 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 your value becomes demonstrated. Um, the other point I wanted to make is, you know, we tend to get um, to the point where we say, you know, serendipity is some word that we have not talked about, and we talk about it in our book. Go to places that you normally wouldn't go to, because you may meet someone whom you hadn't ever intended to meet. And I'll, a very brief example, the day after I retired, literally two days after I, I go to a Canada-Australia forum. Why would I want to go to a Canada-Australia <laughs> forum? I don't live in Australia. I'm not a trade minister. I'm not none of this. But I go because I was invited and I'm sitting next to Derek Burney, the former Canadian uh, ambassador to the United, uh, United States. I'd met Derek on and off, you know, before that. Six months after, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I've retired, just retired, and come back to my group. Six months after I saw him at that conference, my phone rings and it's Corn Ferry. They're looking for a board member for TC Energy, then called TransCanada. And I said, wow, I was really wanting to do, have some connection back to Alberta. And I said, no brainer for me if they think that I could add value. So I said, who gave you my name? Derek Burney, chair of the Corporate Governance Committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my point is that you have to go to places you would not normally go to and interact with people you not, not, would not normally interact with. And I think that's where Board Ready Women serves that function because you are inviting people from across industry sectors and across backgrounds to join. And I think that's why I believe in, in, in the kind of roles that your organization mm -hmm. plays because it's serendipity, that unexpected encounter that delivers results. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Martha? Well, I think my message is a little is, is a little different but i absolutely agree with indira that the whole issue of sponsorship is so critical and we've talked on that and i think as women and if you notice all of our 
all of our examples, the men have sponsored us. So you're absolutely right. You know, it's not a male female thing, but I think as women, we need to start sponsoring other women. But the story I want to tell, which I think is really where we're at right now as women board directors, deals with performance. And when I went onto the bank board, we had a very rigorous uh, peer review system where we evaluated each other anonymously and it was calculated by an, a third party. And then we each got our results of which the chair also got, but we got them, them ourselves. And it was a rating system. And after my first year on the board, I knew I wasn't doing well. I knew I was struggling. But when I got that rating system, and I talk about this in the book, and I realized I was not only not doing well, I was performing below the mean of every other corporate director. It really struck me and it hurt me and it made me think I have got to do better. I'm not used to performing below the mean. But here's the point, Heather. When we've shared this story and a lot of people have read the book and have landed on that story, Many women come up to me and say, well, the reason you were rated so low was because of the male directors. And when I'm confronted with that interpretation, the first time I was just, I was shaken because it had never crossed my mind that that was the reason I was rated so low. I respected the male directors. I never would have thought that was an issue. What I knew, was I was not performing. I cannot hide behind a victim role anymore. And I think as women directors, we need to just take it upon ourselves to recognize, well, maybe there is some bias occasional. I'm not gonna suggest it's all perfect, but by and large, I think it's now in our court to perform and to do it well and to do it as well as we can. And when we know we are not doing it well, we need to seek the advice and the counsel to make it better. So my message is simple. It's in our court and we have the ability to do it and we can't hide behind some other excuse anymore. So, you know, my message is it's easy to get on, but you need to perform and you yes. need all the help you can to perform. <laughs> and that's, you know, the more we as women can help each other perform well, the better we're going to be in terms of having really diverse boards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very well said. And, and thank you for sharing that. You know, Martha, it's one of those things, right? I mean, we all have learning to do. And, and if you think that you're going to be bang on right from the get go, then, then you're really just kidding yourself. And don't hide behind the victim thing. Say, look, I'm taking responsibility for myself gotcha. and, uh, and really seek to understand as to how you can be a better board member. So yes, yes. Thank you for being so honest with us. That is just, uh, it's really inspiring to me and I appreciate it. Um, last but not least, before we go to questions, we'll go to Q&A. What one or two pieces of advice would you give our Board Ready Women listeners here today that hasn't been mentioned previously? I'm sure there's one or two things that, you, that we haven't covered. Is there something you wanted to add? Indira? No, I'm, I'm sitting here reflecting. I think we've covered most of the ground. I was just looking at some of the questions that, that came mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll pick up on one of them. You know, sure. uh, you know, I get asked all the time by 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 people, what kinds of boards should I should I go on? And that's a good one. Large versus medium versus small. I think it comes back to the fit question, and I want to reinforce the fit question because I think your ability to make a difference depends really on 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 the the, the, the not only the size of the board but the question of your own fit with that board. And so my advice to women is really to get uh, a good sense of what your strengths and skills are, what you're passionate about. We've already mentioned that in identifying what boards you should go on and approaching people about those boards. So I, I, I just throw that out there as being an important element that we may mm -hmm. not have emphasized enough. Mm -hmm. 
Martha. Heather, um, being in Alberta, I'm going to draw upon one of the famous Albertans, and that's Don Mazankowski. And um, Don, at one point, served on the board of the University of Alberta when I was there and became a, a good colleague. And I asked him one time, because he was on many boards, I asked him one time, how do you select the boards you go on, Don? And he gave me some of the best advice. And so I'm going to attribute this to him, but I'm going to pass it along. He said, look, you know, all the things that Indira and I have already talked about, aligning yourself with, a, with where you want to be and where you think you can add value and all that. But he said, here's the thing. Look and see who else is on the board. He said, you want to join a board that has directors who you respect and trust and who you will learn from. And he said, the best indication of the health of a corporation is the quality of the other directors. And that was an incredible piece of advice for me because we've all been on boards and every board gets into trouble at times. And you know, these are difficult times for corporations. And you want to, when you're faced with a huge challenge or a crisis, you know, both Indira and I served on bank boards during the financial crisis, you want to be sure that your colleagues and your peers and the directors around the table are people who you respect, who are worthy of your trust, who are genuinely uh, prepared to shoulder the responsibility of being a director, and so that was some of the best advice I, I received. And, and we all have opportunities, whether it's a corporate board or a nonprofit board or a, a community board, these all reflect the people who are in charge of governance, really reflect the health of the institution. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And um, you know, it's, it's wonderful when you can actually then be able to pick up the phone and perhaps call one of them and ask them their experience and how are they, you know, how are, how, how, what's the health of the board? Because, you know, the culture is also important, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, they'll tell you, oh, you know, the favorite line, this is not a troubled company. Everything's <laughs> fine. And it's only going to, it's only going to meet three times a year and it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Don't believe any of that. Mm -hmm. It may not be a troubled company when you join, but believe me, <laughs> every company goes gets into trouble at some point. Yeah. And you have to be able to have confidence in the people around the table, just, you know, to shoulder to shoulder, to deal with that, with whatever crisis comes. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for that, ladies. That, that was just incredible. And, and I hope everybody enjoyed uh, you know, your, your, le the learnings from the book, but you have so many more to share. So let's kind of dive into a few of these uh, Q and A's, if you don't mind. Um, we've got some excellent questions. And, you know, one of the ones that I noticed right off the bat um, was regarding adversity. So uh, it was in the chat here. I'm just going to bring it up. Where's my chat? Um, Katerina. For some reason, okay, let, let me just close this. Uh, let, let's start with this one. Often at the boardroom table, I've observed, um, you know, people that speak above each other. And it says here, men speak above each other. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get this thing. <laughs> there we go. Um, and speaking before somebody else is finished. This, this may not feel comfortable to some people, including women. What advice do you have when you're faced with that dynamic? Let's start with that and I'll find the other one that I was looking for. Well, I think, first of all, you know, we all observe behaviors that are less than ideal uh, in, in so many circumstances, right? And I think that the reality is you have to be um, able to set a high standard yourself without getting put off by someone else's behavior. Uh, now, fortunately, boards have a very good way of getting a feedback on, the, on a director's performance. And believe me, I have, as others have, if you have a director who's constantly interrupting others, who is not recognizing what I call board etiquette, because board time is precious, right? Consider carefully when you make an intervention and how much of that time you want to consume. You, you basically have to have the guts and the courage and the nerve when it's director feedback time 
to identify that particular director by name and the occasions in which that has happened. And believe me, uh, those, those things get rectified or that director is gone. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about setting standards of behavior and standing up for what you think is absolutely high performance, good quality board, board etiquette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Did you want to add anything to that, Martha? Just that Indira told a story. Maybe you want to tell a story about Joe Rotman and, and you intervening with him about women intervening. I oh, thought yeah. that Oh, yeah, I, I was on a board. This is a long time ago. Many of you may know Joe Rotman. Uh, it passed away, sadly. And there were two of us women and a, a, a bunch of men, and some were very, very, very successful, uh, but also very opinionated and and did not let us get a word in edgewise, right? These two, these men just talked and talked and talked. Joe was chairing, did nothing. Well, I had had enough. After three meetings, I spoke to the other woman. And she had the same feeling. I called Joe up. And I said, Joe, have you noticed that we never get a chance to, to, to speak? And when we do, we get shut down by, by our colleagues with whom we respect, but they, need, they don't understand the importance of, of a dialogue and, and, and conversation. And he said, oh my goodness, Indira, thank you for letting me know. Every time I saw the man after that, he, and he had to interact with me, he said, this is the lady who reminded me about the importance of ensuring everybody had a voice, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to politely point out call it. when people are out of line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, calling it is good. Honestly. Exactly. Yeah. And doing so respectfully, mm -hmm. calling out the issue and not the individual, but saying right. this is what, this is a standard with, with to which we, I think we have to be called upon. We need to mm -hmm. adhere to. Mm -hmm. And I think we noticed that on, well, I noticed on, on most of the boards that I've been a part of. I mean, some people follow the etiquette and some people don't. Some people will put their hand up to ask a question. Some people will, you know, just ask it. So, you know, and, and so it really is about, you know, what, what works for that board uh, best. And I think you have to kind of figure that out versus always having to adhere to a certain structure, because I think that's the other thing is we have to be a little flexible from time to time, right? So, yeah. Um, another one here, again, adversity. Um, what if you, was there ever a time when you felt judged unfairly? Now, this one says in the workplace, since we're talking about boards, does, has that ever happened on a board and, and how, did you, how did you handle it? I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of, Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure there have been times, you know, um, Sometimes you're misinterpreted. I yes, think right. I think that could yeah. be uh, the case yeah. where you've said something and someone has interpreted it in a way yeah. that you you didn't mean it to be, but in in some ways you didn't say it clearly enough or you didn't clarify it or you didn't put conditions around it. And I think in that situation, if you're aware that um, you know, you're being um, misquoted or, or misrepresented, it's really important, again, to find the nerve to correct the record mm -hmm. and to go back and be clear about what you said and what you meant. And then to apologize that you have either, you know, somehow offended someone inappropriately or said something you, you know, didn't realize was going to be interpreted in a different way. I think that's usually the case, Heather, <laughs> Uh, at least those would be some of the things that I think back on. I, uh, you know, either I, I spoke too quickly or I didn't think it through clearly in how I was going to make the case. Mm -hmm. And I really respect people for doing that because we all, it, it happens. It happens to all of us at some point in time or another where something is misinterpreted or, or you just want to say, look, sorry, I called that wrong. You know, like it, it's, uh, it's something that I think we all have to admit that it, it happens. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We have lots of people appreciating your, your uh, comments, ladies, on, on the sounding board idea and the aftercare idea uh, when, you're, when you've already joined a, a board as well as your candor. So uh, that, that's fantastic. So what extent is it wise to stage your board aspirations from smaller corporate, corporate boards to the larger ones? 
I think it makes sense. Yeah. I think if 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 you have distinguished yourself, even and let me just say, just even on nonprofit boards, you know, community boards, if you have distinguished yourself and actually kind of gotten your feet wet and begun to understand how boards function. And as you said so well, Heather, they all have their own cultures. They're all a little different and you have to somehow be adaptable to that. But I think it makes an enormous amount of sense that if you've been on a smaller market cap board and you aspire to be on a large market cap, you should be doing exactly what Indira did. You know, you should be identifying those boards that have, that are aligned with the smaller board that you're on and, and, and actually, uh, you know, presenting yourself as a potential director and why you think your, your earlier experience will, will be helpful to that board. You know, I think the main thing here is patience. The large cap boards, everyone that I was on, they do succession planning very, they look out. They know what's happening to their directors three or four years out. They know exactly when the vacancies are going to occur because usually they have specific times when people go off the boards. They either run out of time or they age out. And therefore, you have to be willing to wait a couple years sometimes. But if you're known to them and you've put your hat in the ring, they keep that, they do keep that information and they revisit it all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, so here's one. Well, I'm not a lawyer, accountant, or engineer. I have many years of experience in sustainability and nonprofit governance. I also have an ICD.D. How would you advise leveraging this experience into a corporate board? Indira? So I, you know, I think, first of all, I think it's the advice that we've already given, right? Um, you know, ultimately, it's about experience with the boards as opposed to the narrow, uh, it, narrow fields, right? It doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or a lawyer or an accountant or any of that. I think what really matters is have you had experience with governance, right? With, with helping to provide oversight and strategic direction for whatever organization you've been part of. And I think that's what you're trying to sell and how successfully have you done that? And can you demonstrate from right. your leadership in nonprofits how that would translate into so strategic advice? I mean, the, ultimately, the three things the board do, does is hire a CEO. So do, can you recognize talent? Uh, secondly, can you give strategic advice? Do you understand risk? End mm -hmm. of story, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the three mm -hmm. things you, you mm -hmm. have to do. And so if you can distill your nonprofit smaller board experience, into how you've done those three things, I think that's the best way to go about finding a board and then of course, finding the right fit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then this idea of targeting, right? If you if you think that your your uh, skill set will be suited for a specific company, then that's right. the time for you to kind of yeah. say, look, this is why I would be great for your organization. Yeah. So can, again, I add, can I add something here? To, I mean, people on this call might think that Martha and I have been just successful. We've picked up the phone and in my case, you know, the boards answered, and I got. I have I have been turned down. Mm -hmm. I, I did oh, I did sure. exactly what advice I've given uh, this group today, and there was a board that shall remain nameless because it was perfectly aligned with my background. And I tried. I I offered my name up. I contacted people. Dead silence. Never heard from them. Mm -hmm. So I think people have to be prepared that sometimes you will be turned down, and mm -hmm. that's okay. Uh, you know, whatever the, you know, back to Martha, they, they were looking three years down the road. Maybe they, they had, they were looking for certain expertise. So I think the notion of patience and the notion that it's okay to be turned down, but to keep mm -hmm. trying to find the right one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I agree. Um, would you consider taking a seat on a board if you were to be the only woman? Why or why not? <laughs> it's a good one. Um. You know, I would say the same thing that Don Mazankowski said. It, the gender is important, but it's not the only factor. And, right. uh, you know, some of the best directors I worked with are men. <laughs> and I would go to, you know, I, 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 I go to the wall for all of them, or, you know, many of them, because they are extraordinary people. To me, it's the quality of the other directors. 
And if they see you as being a contributing member, yes, regardless of gender, I would consider it. Um, as long as you're, you feel comfortable that they are looking at you because of what you can bring to the board rather than solely your gender. But honestly, I, I, I think that, you know, you could say, well, does the fact that a board has four women and three men, does that make it a better board? Not necessarily, not necessarily. It's the quality of the individuals that are around the table mm -hmm. rather than solely the gender. Yeah, and it and it takes nerve to to actually do that, right? It does you, take and nerve. And you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. Right? You do. You do. Mm -hmm. Someone has to go first. We have a right. section in that on going first. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's in my one of the stories I tell when I was named president, there was a scathing article that was written by an actual UBC alumnus in a national magazine saying the only reason Martha Piper was appointed president of UBC was because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. There are so many more qualified men out there. And, they, and UBC was determined, determined to appoint a woman over everything else. Now, did that deter my ability to do the job? No. Mm -hmm. Did it affect my confidence? At first it did. It was not easy to accept that when it was on a national you know, magazine that hundreds and thousands of Canadians were reading. But in reality, I believed I was appointed because I could do the job. And had I thought I was being appointed only because I was a woman and didn't have the ability, I never would have accepted the job. Right. So right. I think it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indira, did you have a, anything to add to that one? No, I mean, you know, I've... I've been in the situation, fortunately, unfortunately, being the only woman in just about everything I did because I was the, the, uh, one of the few female professors in engineering. But let me tell you about the first woman who was ever appointed as a professor in engineering at UBC and how important her appointment was for the other women that came after her. Her name was Rabab Ward. She was Middle Eastern by background from Lebanon. And she was appointed to UBC when there were no other female professors. And I think the value of, uh, and she was amazing. She did belly dancing as a hobby. And the <laughs> fact that she was so unusual, and she's electrical engineer. She's now a, a foreign associate of National Academy of Engineering, absolutely outstanding. I think if women want to, to make social change, you have to be prepared to be first. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared to push the envelope. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what this is all about. Totally agree. I totally agree. And I would encourage all of us to consider that because I've, I've had to make that decision a few times. And quite frankly, it was a good decision. It, it was not, didn't turn out to be a bad decision. So, I mean, it's something you sometimes just have to take a leap of faith too, right? Um, what about this one? Uh, as our uh, number of directors grow, what have you, what have you, as numbers of, female directors grow, what have you experienced that you would consider to be unique co contributions women are making in the boardroom? Indira, you talk about that in the book in terms of uh, the ability to look at the total picture, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's right. I think the women that really, and I've had this experience on a couple of boards I've served on TC Energy, for example, and the women, who've made unique contributions are the women who have the ability to look at the big picture and understand the impending changes, what, what's coming. You know, ESG is an obvious one, you know, diversity is another one, but you know, AI, what's going to shape the workplace of the future, um, all of these kinds of things. And I think the ability to broadly understand the forces that are interacting in our world, the role of China, the role of the trade, role of U the United States, to broadly understand those shifts. That's, I think, the unique contribution uh, women can make. And I think that I've seen women do that and do it very, very effectively. Um, you know, I, Paula Rose put Reynolds was on the board of TC Energy and I was just blown away at mm -hmm. how remarkable she was because she had, she had that ability to look across the, the big picture. Very good. My, my experience is similar. And let me just say, I think it's 
again, it's our time. If you look at the critical issues corporations, institutions, organizations are facing right now, yes, they're economic, but those pale in comparison to the social justice issue, the, the unrest, the polarization of, of, of uh, the populations, the discord, the demands of social media, the issues around communication and how we actually um, get our message out. And in some ways, I think women have been our ahead of the time. They, they face those issues every day. And they bring that kind of forward-looking thinking to the board. And my example is Sophie Brochu, who sits on the Bank of Montreal board and head of Hydro-Quebec. And she would always ask the question that people would kind of go, what? What's that about? And then six months later, it would come back to, to nip us in the heels. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I see women doing that, uh, being able to look a little further than just the quarterly report right. and the financial balance sheet right. every quarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So one last question, um, and then we'll move to our closing remarks because we're just about at 520 here. Um, does the increased exposure to director liability, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis ESG issues, affect your or one's appetite to sit on boards, what best practices do you recommend to mitigate these risks? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say again, I think you must be very selective in the boards you choose to sit on. And while it's never risk-free, nothing is risk-free, you want to mitigate your risk as much as you can. So you need to do your homework. You need to read the proxy. You need to read the annual reports. You need to speak to the chair. You need to talk to the chair of the governance committee because that really speaks to the issues. You need to look at past agendas. And so, yes, in many ways, the, the environment is becoming more complex. And of course, you wanna look at what their liability insurance is and what, what how you will be protected. But I think, if you do your homework and you recognize that you can't ensure that everything is going to be perfect, but if you are convinced, and I go back to the people around the table and the CEO, if you have confidence in them and you have confidence in the, in the uh, enterprise that you're joining and the purpose of the enterprise and some of the directions the enterprise has taken, then I would say you've got to, you know, you've got to step up you know, and, and take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And Dara, please. Yeah, I mean, I think ESG is a, a particularly important one because, uh, because of the, the, the potential for major impact for, to any corporation, right? If they don't get this right. Uh, and I think it's, you know, the, the only way that you can protect the corporation and its reputation is if you do, the, if you do your best effort. And so I think what's happening with board, for boards is that the amount of preparation you need to do has gone up a notch, right? Mm -hmm. It has definitely gone up a notch. And it's not good enough to perhaps just read the board material and say, I've done my job. It becomes incumbent, I think, about, about board members in, in, to ensure that they are constantly staying on top of these big issues, right? Um, you know, on whether it's climate change or or, any, or government policy, for example, right? If you if you don't if you don't understand where the governments are going, and you know we have the throne speech today, and you're not on top of the the, the directions that government of Canada is going, your company could be sideswiped. So mm -hmm. I come back to the enormous responsibility of preparation, of going beyond, above and beyond the business of the company to looking at all of the things that could potentially affect its long-term viability and being uh, on top of that. So that's the only way you can protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can shy away from something because it's risky. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, if you're a leader and a female and you wanna make a difference, you're going to have to go into areas where there's going to be high risk and that's what NERV is all about. 
leader and make a difference. I love it. I love it. I think that those are fantastic words to uh, end our session. Ladies, you're just incredible leaders and your book is fantastic. And I encourage everyone to please get a copy. Um, I, you know, I've been on many boards, but I learned a lot from, from reading that. It's just very inspirational as well. So, so thank you very much for sharing that. It's, it's very, very relevant for, for women at every leaders at every age and stage of their career. So um, I'm sure you'll see the link that uh, Katerina has put in the chat function. So on behalf of all of us, and on, and uh, my apologies again on the uh, on the uh, boo-boo, it's UBC alum as well as the U of A alum, as well as all of us. I apologize, Martha. <laughs> I was kind of That's caught off guard there. It's That's like, well, it had, I know it wasn't U of A because I know in Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much from all of us. Um, really appreciate your time and, and good luck and congratulations on the book. So thank you, thank you. Heather. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very, much. very, very well done. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it over to Kathy for some parting remarks. Kathy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, and I know Heather said, please go buy the book. Here we all have our own copy. Please uh, click on the link. And I know it's available in other places as well, but um, here it is. Um, and thank you so much uh, to Martha and Indira, and of course our own Heather uh, for this really wonderful panel this afternoon. It really has been one of my favorite events that we've done at Board Ready Women um, since we've been doing this. I love the authenticity and the candor and just really the honesty of the discussion. So um, lots of uh, good advice coming out and I have been taking notes and, and I was gonna highlight um, a few. So um, I remember the, the Georgia O'Keeffe quote that Martha referenced in the beginning. And so I would encourage everyone, all of us really, um, to use our nerve to speak out and step up and confront power and challenge. So whether you're an executive or on a board, I think it will benefit your organization. Um, another one was do what you do extremely well and create networks so that people recognize what you are doing and then use that being seen to your advantage and adding value and distinguishing yourself. So um, this is all about uh, networking and also the difference between mentors and sponsors. You never know where that sponsor is going to come from. So go to places and events that are outside of your comfort zone. Um, and so I remember the story, Indira, you talked about uh, your sponsor who promoted you for the Bank of Nova Scotia. And then also, I think it was the Australian Canadian or maybe it's vice versa right. um, event who then promoted you for TC Energy. So um, opportunities are everywhere and, and maybe the timing is a little delayed, but, but they're there. Um, and then also with respect to getting your first board position, uh, when you're qualified and the phone is not ringing, um, be pragmatic and, and look for where you can add value and know what boards you want to join and why. And then learn to ask, have the nerve to ask. So um, I love that. And then really, uh, and people who are senior board members, regardless of their gender, uh, remember to provide support for new board members mm -hmm. once they're appointed. And I know Heather flagged this, but I saw it in the chat also, that aftercare. <laughs> so um, it's very helpful. And um, my last uh, thing that I've noted from the discussion, that there's lots and, um, in the book, but there are dumb questions. <laughs> so <laughs> listen to other strong board members and how they ask questions and drive strategy forward and emulate them. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, our next Board Ready Women, session will be on January 26th and um, that panel is going to be on shareholder activism and recent trends including the board's role in managing shareholder activism and um, we're pleased uh, to be having uh, Wes Hall who's executive chairman and founder of Kingsdale Advisors uh, widely considered a preeminent leader in the field um, he will be joining the panel and we'll have a few others. So look out for the invitation and uh, register to join that. And uh, Martha and Indira, thank you for the plug about joining Board Ready Women. Um, um, and Indira, I think you said you challenged everyone to think about how you could help support us. 
and make it better. So we really do need the support of individual members and corporate sponsors. And I know that Katarina will put a link in the chat. It's also on our website. So I would encourage everyone to please consider um, supporting or sponsoring us. And uh, we have larger sponsorship packages available as well, if anyone would like to talk about that. So thank you to everyone for joining us uh, for this really fantastic session today. And um, that is it for that's our last event for 2021. So we'll see everyone in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.